I feel like I need to do the, can you hear me? Because it works so, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> wow, what is? Okay, is this better? So I'm gonna warn you right now, I pace. So there's a very good chance I'm gonna pace where I'm not supposed to. Feel. But um, I don't know what else to say, right? You know, we should have a line. Don't go past this. Uh, I'm Kevin. It's not that exciting. Or at least, well, I'm excited by it because, well, I'm me. I did pick this name when I turned 18, so I probably should have picked something better. You know, Kevin Johnson's kind of boring. It's actually another Kevin Todd Johnson with the same birth date in Florida. He's always wanted by the police. So <laughs> that was a mistake. <laughs> It's awful. I, uh, <laughs> the reason I point that out is when I was flying out here, um, it's the first time it's affected my flights. Uh, normally it just affects things like if, like I had a car stolen and when the cops picked me up to show me, you know, come bring me downtown to talk about the car being stolen, uh, they ran my name and it was like, uh, you know you're wanted in Miami. I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> why? Um, so, you know, but uh, it's uh, you know, one of those weird things. Uh, today we're going to talk about security researcher, security besmircher. I do believe that sec that last word is one I made up, um, but I think it works, right? It's like uh, it's kind of like gruntled. You guys know about gruntled, right? Disgruntled people and gruntled people. But according to the dictionary, gruntled is not real either. So I don't know. It's one of those things. We're trying, uh, but we're going to talk about a lot of things today. And of course, I turned off the remote, so that didn't work. Uh, me, woohoo! I am the founder of Secure Ideas. Uh, that is a security consulting firm based out of Jacksonville, Florida, Salt Lake City, Tulsa, and Charlotte. Um, mostly in Jacksonville, sorry guys. Um, we are building up our presence here in Salt Lake City. We've got two consultants now, uh, the awesome Danny and uh, Jason Wood. And uh, <laughs> we're also mean. <laughs> If you ever want to reach out to Danny, uh, just email him at seahawks at secureideas.com. So <laughs> the people who know Danny will understand why that was as mean as it was. <laughs> so uh, I'm the founder. We've been around for four and a half years. Uh, we're just a bunch of nerds that accidentally got into security consulting and people keep hiring us. Uh, we're not sure exactly how that keeps happening, but we're not complaining. Uh, you know, I tell everybody I have a business goal of being a one percenter. Um, I'd like them to have an Occupy Elderberry Court because I own, I have so much money. Um, hasn't happened yet, but I'm working on it, right? I'm also IONS faculty. IONS is this company, uh, their group, they, they do these interesting things that they call ask an expert, but then they let me get on the phone, so I'm not sure how that works. I, and uh, I'm a course author. I wrote the web pen testing and mobile security curriculums at SANS Institute and uh, continue to teach uh, various classes all over the place. As a matter of fact, we're really excited. The first professional evil uh, pen test training class course, uh, event, whatever the heck it's called. You know, luckily I don't have to speak for my job. But um, it's coming up in April. We're really excited about that. I'm a podcaster and open source project lead. And I have to say it, my wife says it's the nerdiest thing ever. I am a 501st member. For the people who don't know, the 501st is a worldwide charity group that dresses in uh, screen accurate costumes from Star Wars, right? So uh, you know, there I am in my uh, Imperial officer, uh, my daughter in Darth Vader and you know, Harry Potter. And um, <coughs> I have an Imperial guard, I'm building a stormtrooper. I am building a Wookiee, a Chewbacca. And let me just tell you that the idea of latch hooking seven feet of mesh uh, to fur is uh, as tedious as you can imagine. Um, so <laughs> this is what I do. Like I said, my wife says it's the nerdiest thing I've ever done. I pointed out she met me when I was 26, so she doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, I'm a nerd, right? Uh, I've got two kids who you'll hear a lot about, Brenna and Sarah. Uh, Brenna and Sarah, uh, Brenna will be 13 next month, uh, which means that she will enter the time where she hates me uh, for a few years. And uh, Sarah will be nine uh, in June. They are amazing. I'm biased, right? I learned when uh, Brenda was born, my oldest, that every parent in the world believes that their child is the smartest, most beautiful, most amazing kid ever. The second thing I learned was every other parent was wrong, right? 
And uh, so uh, they are one of the main reasons I do what I do, and they're actually what drives this talk. Uh, because I think that this talk is something that's critical for us as an industry. But I'm biased, right? So, uh, and, you know, if you want to reach out to me ever, now, of course, this doesn't work. That's wonderful. That means I have to be up here. I hate being up on stage. I really do. It's funny. I'm a traveling consultant that speaks all over the country. I hate public speaking. Uh, I hate traveling, and I hate meeting new people. So I picked this job. I don't know how that happened, right? But the reality is that what we've got today is a wild west of security, right? Uh, everybody and their brother knows about security today. They may not know good things, they may not know correct things, but it's something we talk about. It's a big topic. Hell, the fact that what we do has made it to the State of the Union address two years in a row freaks me out. Because look around you, we are the people the President of the United States is talking about. And I don't care about your politics, I don't care whether you hate the man or love the man or are indifferent. The fact that what we do is a topic of such importance that it's talked about at that level should scare you. It's constantly being brought up in the news. Hell, we have TV shows. By the way, this is going to be a PG-13 talk. I should warn you now. Um, but we have TV shows about what we do. And they're very accurate. Because um, how many people here saw, <laughs> how many people here saw the first episode of Scorpion? Right? Yeah. How many people here have hung themselves from an airplane flying over a, a runway at 200 miles an hour? Right? Yeah, with a Cat 5 cable that you pulled out of the plane. Oh, I'm sorry. It was 5E. I apologize. You're right. See, I'm not even accurate. Oh, right? I want to know where that cable came from. <laughs> right? Uh, it doesn't matter. But, and we talk a lot about, right, you hear on Twitter, oh, CSI Cyber, oh, why can't they make it accurate? Because our job is boring. <laughs> right? I mean, come on. How exciting do you think your mother is going to find it watching you type in VI? Because we all know VI is the right answer, right? Yeah. I said that once in class. I was teaching a class and I made the comment, you know, yeah, you know, the only religious war I get into is VI versus Emax. And that's because we all know VI wins. This guy in the back of the room slammed his fist into the desk, rah, stood up and walked out. <laughs> I'm like, what the heck? About an hour later, he came back in. He was a little calm. I walked up to him like, dude, what? What the heck? Right? What was that? And he, it turned out he was one of the developers of Emax. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So my response was, dude, Emacs is an amazing operating system. But <laughs> <laughs> you guys, just so you know, I don't necessarily say the right things at the right time, right? I'm a very professional person, says it in my slogan, professional evil. But um, I spoke at NASA once. That was awesome. I started my talk, a whole bunch of NASA scientists in the room, and I started my talk with, hey, guys, when we're done, can you show me the fake moon landing site? Too soon. <laughs> there was dead silence in the room, right? It was like, uh, okay, I pissed somebody off. So I, I decided to try to save it, right? Because you got to save the joke. And I'm like, don't worry about it. Mythbusters proved you were there. <laughs> that didn't save the joke. Uh, just so you guys know, and I should have warned you, uh, I basically am an ADD speaker. <laughs> All right, squirrel, whoa. What are we going to talk about today? So you'll hear lots of random tangents and things like that. Uh, the other thing is I have an amazing sense of humor. I do want to be clear, I did not say an amazingly good sense of humor, right? <clears throat> but I like my jokes. My favorite joke currently is, uh, do you guys know why Walmart wasn't hacked? They weren't a target. But, <laughs> right? Come on. <laughs> I told you, it's not good sense of humor. I told my daughters recently, I'm like, hey, do you know what's blue and smells like red paint? And my daughters are used to me, so Brenna came out with blue paint. She was right. But uh, <laughs> so, yes, I'm warping them. Both of my daughters will have two years of counseling for every year they live with me. But 
The reality is, jumping back, is that security is miserable. You know, I'm a pen tester. Plain and simple. My job is to come in, according to many people, by the way, they're wrong, but many people think that my job is to come in, beat you up, tell you you suck, and go home. Right? Did you get hacked? Yes, I hacked you! Oh well. The reality is our job is to actually show problems and give suggestions on how to fix it. Right? Our job is to actually improve things. But as an industry, I think we've moved more toward the idea that our job is to beat up on people. Right? Because there's tons of issues out there. There's tons of problems. I go into organizations, I mean look, as far as I'm aware, it is 2015. And yet, I regularly find MSO8067 on networks. For the people who don't know, that is the stereotypical way to demonstrate hacking a machine, and the patch was released in 2008. So seven years ago. By the way, if I recall correctly, the operating system it's for is no longer supported by Microsoft. Right? I don't believe MSO8 is support, affected anything new currently, uh, if I remember correctly. But that's ridiculous. I have been in major organizations. I have been in critical infrastructure and found MSO8067. Now, of course, my day just got easier. Right? As Danny said yesterday, owned. It's not how he phrased it, but same thing. Right? There's tons of issues. And that we're just ignoring the fact that we're not maintaining our stuff well, we also have, pfft, I'm a hacktivist. No, you're a dickhead, right? I mean, <coughs> I just, it's ridiculous. I'm a hacktivist. What made you a hacktivist? I took the word, put it on my label. How many people here are a member of Anonymous? <laughs> just asking. But if you go on Facebook, how many people have the Guy Fox mask as their profile picture next to their real name, email address, and physical address? Yeah, you're anonymous. What the hell? Right? I don't think that word means what you think it means. <coughs> so we got hacktivists. We got hackers. Right? APT. Everybody drink. Right? Advanced persistent threat, also known as phishing. <laughs> it just bothers me, right? And then not even starting to talk about the disgruntled users. I was in the airport, right? Which, by the way, I can almost start every story I have with. I was in the airport. Um, it's bad enough that the night staff at the Atlanta airport know me by name and will actually bring me blankets when I'm there overnight. Right? You know when you're being treated nicer by the cleaning lady than your own family, you travel too much. But <coughs> we have disgruntled users. I'm sitting in the airport and I'm, I'm eating my lunch because I was flying out here and I had a, a bit of a layover. It was a, it was a really long layover for me. I normally have 45 minutes to bolt through Atlanta. I had three hours. I didn't know what to do. So um, I, I went and I had lunch and these two guys are sitting next to me and they hate their boss who, by the way, I'll just be clear, it's not me. But they're sitting there at the table, and these two guys are ranting about the problems they have with their company. And they're releasing details that I would love to share with you right now, because that company is based here. And I know information about problems with their systems. I know information about data that's exposed where it shouldn't be exposed. And I happen to know the domain administrator password for their network because they discussed it. And I'm sitting there going, I'm writing this down, <laughs> right? This is awesome. Man, I hope we get a pen test with them, <laughs> right? I, you know, and disgruntled users do stupid stuff. And then there's mistakes. People just make mistakes. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. And it exposed stuff, right? And we have all these problems going on, and then we have new technology coming out, right? How many people here have an Apple Watch? I was hoping, right? Nobody yet, but how many people here are going to have an Apple Watch, right? Yeah, I saw a hand over there, right? Okay, I'm getting one, but I don't want to admit it because they're ridiculously expensive. But <laughs> I don't want to tell everybody I'm buying the edition one for $15,000. <laughs> That's ridiculous. 
But that technology is coming, right? Wearable technology. We now have the internet of things. Wasn't the internet always of things? <laughs> right? I mean, like, I get what they're trying to say, but we're making our jobs more difficult. We're making it more complex. And the reality is, in my opinion, our jobs aren't harder now than they were 20 years ago. And I'm an old fart enough to know what our job was like 20 years ago. It's not more complex. We still have the same problem. You accepted input, trusted the input, and made use of it. Right? Isn't that the nature of our problem? SQL injection, what is it? Accepting input, trusting it, using it. Buffer overflow, accepting input, trusting it, using it. Social engineering, accepting input, trusting it, using it. Right? That's it. Yet, if you read Twitter, if you read any news feed, we now have cross-site scripting, report, reference, SQL injection, command injection. That's one vulnerability, right? We now have run out of one and two word vulnerabilities and we now have five and 10 word vulnerabilities. I was just talking to a guy and I'm gonna mess up the name of it, but it was like path traversal cascading style sheet injection. I wish I was making that up, right? It was like, what are you doing? Well, you inject a path that references a different cascading style sheet and they load that other one. Isn't that cross-site scripting? Right? But somebody had to have an ego come up with a new name because we have to be famous. We, in my opinion, have turned into an industry of bullies. Right? We have. We name and shame. We beat up on people. We tell them they suck. We're mean. How do we even know what the real threats are? According to Mandiant, it's the Chinese or the North Koreans, right? It's what Mandiant says, so it must be true, because they make lots of money, right? We attributed Sony hack to North Korea. Why? Because of a stupid movie. Anybody watch that movie? Did you enjoy it? Really? Okay, I'm cool with that, <laughs> right? I've not watched it. Why? Because it looked dumb to me. I hadn't even heard about the movie until North Korea supposedly attacked Sony, right? We don't even know what the real vulnerabilities are. I talk to developers all the time because I believe part of my responsibility is to sit down and actually educate people, right? Not just come in and go, wow, you suck but to say, here are the problems, here's why they are problems, and we talk to people, and they don't even truly understand what the issue is, right? I had a developer once, uh, logged into one of their websites, through Burp, of course, right, Burp. And I look, and they've dumped down a whole bunch of Visual Basic script. And in the Visual Basic script is the connection string to the SA password, with the SA account, with the SA password. And it was a really long, complex password. And I say to the developer who's sitting next to me, I'm like, hey, dude, I've got your connection string right here and you're connecting as SA and I now have that. And the guy goes, yeah, but look at how complex that password is. <laughs> yeah, I get it, it's complex, but you know, the key word there was look, <laughs> right? <laughs> then I had another guy in class once, right? I'm teaching a class, we're talking about cracking passwords and I got this guy and he says to me, oh, I'm not worried about that. I have the world's strongest password. And it's really, he's like, yep. I'm like, what is it? And he told me. <laughs> so, like, okay, but even worse, it was a four letter name. So I say to this guy, dude, I say dude a lot in stories, I'm sorry. But I'm like, dude, how is that the world's strongest password? Because you don't understand, I'm, 40, I'm 52 years old. I almost gave my age of 42, but he's 52 years old. And that was his dog's name when he was four and nobody knows his dog's name from when he was born. And you know what? He's right. If the threat really was somebody finding out who he was and trying to determine his password, I won't call it a strong password, but it's less likely that somebody would know that. That's a good point. The problem is that's not the threat. That's not what he's trying to protect against. What he's trying to protect against is somebody with a script going after all the possible accounts on that system. In which case, a four letter password, I don't even consider a password. <laughs> it might as well be blank. 
right? And so I explain this to the guy, and the guy gets freaked out. We're not even talking about the fact that he said he had one password, right? But, <coughs> so I'm telling the guy, and he's freaking out. His eyes get this big, and sweat comes here, and he, boom, out the door. And he comes back in about 45 minutes later. He's like, <sighs> I was like, whoa, you okay? And he's like, yeah, man, you all, oh, man, you freaked me out. I just went, I changed, I changed my password. I said, really good. Did you pick something? Like, did you pick something good? He's like, yeah. I said, what is it? He told me. So <laughs> I fixed part of the problem, but not the other part. We're working on it, right? But and now we're even into a problem of are we even allowed to test what we want to test? How many people here use cloud-based stuffs? Right? Yeah. Do you guys know why it's called the cloud? Nope. Visio icon for the internet is a cloud, right? It's on the internet, so it's cloud. So here's my deal. Here's what I want you guys to start doing. Start referring to databases as the cylinder, <laughs> right? I found cylinder injection in your application. That'd be awesome, won't it? Yeah. Yeah, so please do that for me. But like, are we allowed to test our cloud apps? Are we allowed to go after those things? Can we go after that third party? Can we determine what's going on? We don't know. And we have major flaws, at least according to Reuters and the news and CNN. Hell, they have their own logo. I've been a nerd for way too long, right? I grew up nerdy. I joke and say, you know, the guy that used to steal my lunch money in school still does, but he makes a damn good Subway sandwich. <coughs> but no, nobody told me if I wanted to be a hacker, I had to be good at Photoshop. People were actually disappointed last Friday, or was it this Friday? It was last Friday that the SSL vulnerabilities came out, right? I lose track of time. There wasn't a logo. And people actually said that. Like, this can't be that serious. It doesn't have a logo. <laughs> if you were one of those people who said that, please do me a favor. Beat the shit out of yourself. <laughs> right? I mean, come on. We're building this a heartbleed. Ah! Shell Shock didn't even have one logo. It had multiple logos. Right? And what the hell is Poodle? I mean... Poodles are freaky looking dogs, but they don't really scare me. But we named a vulnerability. We have logos. And a lot of people have talked to me about this, and I had, I've had people say to me, oh, but Kevin, that's good. It's good we have logos, because now we've got people talking. Yeah, but you know what? They're talking out their ass. So it didn't help. And then worse, and Friday proved it, I have major companies that I've worked with that did not apply the patches last week because the severity of the bug can't be that high because there wasn't a logo. We've had companies that have come to us and have said, can you verify we're not vulnerable to Heartbleed? You know, you're still running Windows 311. No, no, no. We just want to make sure we're not vulnerable to Heartbleed. That's a problem. That's a negative. We are actually being detrimental to our own security by doing this crap. But as an industry, we're doing it. And we're making it worse, right? And my question is, and this is what really drives me on this talk, right? Is how do we even know what we're allowed to do? And we say all the time, right? Uh, I think it was Jeremiah Grossman came out with an awesome blog post. Test yourself. Hack yourself. And Troy Hunt out in Australia wrote a great blog post about the same thing. And I agree. I think you should be testing. You should be assessing your own stuff. But what about the people testing the internet? What about the people who just say, hey, there's a vulnerability. Let me see if they're vulnerable to it. I don't know them, but I'm going to find out. Are we allowed to do that? And some people tell me we are. Some people tell me we're not, right? Here's an example. And I want to be very clear here. I respect Robert Graham greatly. He is a smart person. But this is what he posted on Twitter during the shell shock stuff. This is me right now. Seriously, did you people think I wouldn't? For the people who don't know, that's a screenshot of uh, 
<laughs> wire shark, right? I almost called it TCP dump. <laughs> like, I really did, because I don't use wire shark, I use TCP dump <laughs> to do the captures, but that's just because I'm nerdy. But, uh, wire shark, of him scanning internet facing IP addresses for the shell shock vulnerability and exploiting it. And his answer when we called him out on it was, well, I'm just running ping. Ping's not that big a deal. The problem is, he knows he's just running ping. I know by looking at that that he's just running ping in the capture I see. But what else is he running? And if you're the, he's running Wireshark, good answer. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> he's a genius. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, well, we are hiring. But, um, so, but what else is he running? And if you're the company that had that traffic come to you and you detected it, don't you have to respond as if he's malicious? Isn't there the potential for you to have to do a breach notification if you can't identify? If you don't have enough information to say that he didn't go further, my read of some of the no breach notification laws is if you can't prove you weren't breached, you have to notify that you were, right? That's a problem. And when I've talked to Robert about this, via the super efficient way to have a conversation of Twitter, um, he doesn't think that's an issue. I do, right? And his answer is we're doing it for the greater good. We're trying to help people. So I asked him, great, you're trying to help people. Out of all the IP addresses that you identified that were vulnerable to Shellshock, how many of them did you reach out to and notify? And the answer was none. They can follow me on Twitter. How egotistical is that? If you want to know if you're vulnerable, follow me on Twitter, right? Now, I looked at his follower list. It's not everybody on the planet, right? It's not even every business owner on the planet. Yet, they're supposed to know that Robert Graham is nicely exploiting their system. Not a vulnerability assessment here, right? He exploited it, but it's for the greater good. Greater good for his fame, but... We have other network examples, right? The Apple Developer Network went down. 100,000 records were pulled because a hacktivist security researcher, he doesn't have a lab coat, but he's a researcher, right? Found a SQL injection flaw. And I wanna be very clear. I agree that Apple should not be vulnerable to this. Totally. This guy pulled 100,000 records. They took the developer network offline for more than a week, which means that every one of those startups that are trying to build the next Angry Birds didn't have access to do the things they needed to do. People who had jobs weren't able to do what their job required, right? People who were interested in learning IT and programming and security weren't able to. And when you ask this guy, hey, why did you pull 100,000 records? His answer was, well, I just wanted to prove it was a problem. Now, how many people here have done SQL injection before? Right? I'm not even going to ask you if you did it legally. Right? How many people here have done SQL injection before? Right? How many of you that raised your hand know about the count function? Where instead of actually pulling the records, he could have said, count how many records I would have pulled. He still would have gotten the 100,000 number. He still would have proven that he was able to do it. But you know what? It's not as sexy. It's not as headline grabbing. It's not as bad to the other company, right? And so we have people doing this, but don't worry about it. I don't worry about it. I know you guys are concerned. It's okay. He posted on Twitter, Apple, this is definitely not a hack attack. I am not a hacker. I do security researcher. Now, I do want to point out, he said security research, not, research, not researcher. But I do want to point out, he didn't copy Apple's Twitter account. He just said Apple. <laughs> right? So somehow Apple's supposed to know it. I don't know who Mike Butcher is. Uh, I should have found out before I put this in the slide, but um, he now knows, right? Again, how egotistical is it? I'm a Turkish guy that is so awesome, Apple must follow me, right? And that's what he did. But he's a security researcher, so it's okay because it wasn't really hacking, it was research, right? And that makes it fun. But, you know, don't worry about it. He targeted Google too, right? And this time he actually crashed the servers, right? Twice. One time wasn't enough. They brought it back up. He tried to assume he could do it again. He could. 
He was just verifying that it wasn't a fluke, right? That it really was him that crashed it. Again, I hear from security researchers all the time on the internet that it's okay because there's no cost to what they're doing. It doesn't hurt anybody. Yet I'll tell you right now, Google had to react as that it was a real hack. Because you know what? It was a real hack. No matter what the guy calls it, it's real. That's like me walking in here, holding up a gun, shooting somebody, and saying, wait, look, I was just researching whether the bullet would actually go out. You never know. Some guns jam. Right? It was research. It wasn't murder. Doesn't sound like a psychopath to you, does it? Here, this is what we've got going on. And we as the industry seem to push this up and go, this is awesome. Look at that guy. He's a researcher. He's so cool. Let's put him on stage. Right? Let me talk to you about ethics. And this is what I think we're lacking here. And here's the problem. When you talk about ethics, a lot of people say, ah, we don't need laws. Matter of fact, Robert Graham posted a whole blog post where he discussed the fact that we should not be under the chilling effects of the law because we're researchers. That's a scary phrase. We should not be affected by the chilling effects of the law. You know laws like don't speed, don't kill people, don't steal, right? Those are laws. And while we may not agree that the laws are good, I will argue with the best of you that the CFAA needs improvement. But the reality is there are laws. We have to follow them. But I'm not talking about laws here. I'm talking about ethics. There are things that are ethical yet illegal. And there are things that are legal yet not ethical. Right? And I'll use Godwin's law. Right? It was illegal for people to hide Jews in Nazi Germany during World War II. But I don't think it was unethical to hide Jews in Nazi Germany. Right? And I'm not comparing this to the Nazis. This is not a security researchers or Hitler, right? Oh, good, I appreciate that, <laughs> right? But the reality is, ethics are what are allowed by your sense of right and wrong. We need ethics to guide us. And I'll, I'll be blunt, I'm gonna stand up here and tell you, I'm not smart enough to know the right ethics. Because I was asked once, I was, I was somewhere and I'm talking about doing the right thing and having permission and having scope. And this guy in the audience said to me, so Kevin, you're telling me you would never hack somebody without permission? You'd never break the law? And I said, no, I'm not telling you that at all because I speed. I drive too fast in my poor little Civic, right? <clears throat> and I'll tell you right now, somebody messed with my daughters? <laughs> Bets are off, <laughs> right? I all of a sudden forget the professionally and professionally evil. You know, I'll admit that. I don't know where my line is, but I know I have a line. I know that there will be something that will make me consider crossing that line. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you I'm a good person. Because I learned a long time ago, I'm not good. I don't deserve what I have. I've been blessed. But I do believe that we have to have an ethical standard. And we've got some out there, right? We do have ISC squared has a great ethics co code of ethics, right? By the way, I hope you heard the italics and quotes around great there. You know, according to their code of ethics, you should not interact with black hats. So does that mean I'm not allowed to run tools that a black hat wrote? According to my read, yes. I'll tell you, my clients would be at a disadvantage if I didn't run tools that a black hat wrote, right? So I violate that code of ethics every day. And I'm a CISSP, so if you want to report me, have a blast, right? I follow black hats on Twitter. I follow black hats on the internet to see what they're doing. I think that's in mandatory for us. As Danny said yesterday in his talk, right, we should constantly be learning and us have an ethical guideline that tells us we can't learn from the source of the attacks we're trying to protect against is asinine. Not even getting into the fact that most of the ethical guidelines we have from SANS and GIAC and ISC squared are driven entirely by capitalistic greed. I'm a certification company and you'll pay me to certify you and you'll agree to follow the ethics I have that bind you to my certification. 
brilliant, right? Money. And this is what we run into. We run into things like this. And I'm sure that if you look up on this slide, you see people up there that you admire and people you hate. Because I look up there and I see Snowden. And I'm not going to get into an argument, but I believe that man's a traitor and needs to be shot in the head because that is the penalty for traitor in the United States. And other people will look you in the face and tell you he's a hero. He's a whistleblower. He saved lives. And you know what? I have a feeling both of us may be right. Right? Because again, I'm not smart enough to know what the right way is. But I'll tell you that I look at things that Snowden did. I look at things Anonymous does. And some of the stuff Anonymous does, I look at and go, yes! Do it again! And there are days I look at what Anonymous does and say, burn in hell! Right? I look at Jester, and I cheer every time he says, tango down. Right? And I'll admit the hypocrisy of that. Right? I got no problem standing up and telling you I'm a hypocrite. But I am. And I say it's because I'm not smart enough to know what the right answer is. But here's the problem. We are smart enough to know what the right answer is. And if we don't stand up and say, this is okay and this isn't, we're fucked. Plain and simple. It's what we need to. We need to stand up and say, this is okay and this is not. And there's ways to do this, right? One of the ways that I hear about all the time is, we could pass a law. Yeah! Was it Rapid7 just started a petition to like modify the CFAA? Was it Rapid7? I don't mean to pick on a company if it wasn't them, right? They'll call us anyways to try to sell us something. But, um, <laughs> so, right, we need to change the CFAA. And I don't know about you guys, but I've presented to the Senate. I've been in a room with senators and, and House of Representatives and their staff, and I've talked to them about security issues and been embarrassed to say they represented me because they don't know what we do. We have a congressman that's in charge of the technology committee that proudly admits he's never written an email. And again, I'm not arguing Republican, Democrat, any of that crap, because I don't care. But I do know that if we're going to have people who don't understand what we do making the laws, we're screwed. We need to provide that guidance. And I'll tell you, this is why, right? I'm sitting in a plane, and I had a lady sitting next to me, and I talk to people, right? I don't know why I hate people, but I'm talking to this lady, and we're having a really good conversation. We're just, bah, 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 wow, yeah, it's wonderful. Here's pictures of my kids. Here's my little, you know, all this cool stuff, right? And then the woman says to me, very nicely, obvious question, hey, what do you do? And I said what I always say, I'm a penetration tester. And I get the answer, does that have something to do with oil? No. No, it doesn't. Well, it depends on the target, <laughs> right? I don't know. And uh, so she said, well, what is that? And I said, well, you know, companies hire me, and I hack into their systems to find vulnerabilities. I steal data to show them where the risk is, and then I tell them how to fix it. She looked at me, and she goes, you're a hacker? And I said, yes, ma'am, I am, right? She didn't talk to me the rest of the flight. <laughs> yep. Another time, my daughter was five, my oldest, Brenna. We were at a restaurant, and we're sitting there, and the waitress comes up, and she looks at Brenna. Oh, you're so adorable. She's, Brenna's beautiful. There's no way my genes created her. But um, she says to Brenna, what do you want to be when you grow up? And Brenna looks at her, proudest day of my life. Brenna looks her in the face and says, I want to hack computers like my dad. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? And the waitress looked at me and goes, what did she say? And I'm like grinning from ear to ear, right? Like she said she wants to hack computers like her dad. And she goes, are you her dad? I said, that's what her mom says. <laughs> right? The waitress laughed. There's no proof. Like I said, they're beautiful. They can't be mine. But <laughs> my wife hates that I say that. <laughs> the waitress left. We had a new waitress the rest of the night. The new waitress said, I don't know what happened over here, but she won't come back to the table because somehow I was going to steal her identity at Longhorn. <laughs> right? That's a problem. Because we're supposed to be the good guys. 
We're supposed to be the people helping. And I feel very, very strongly, and I, I mean this, this is from the bottom of my heart. Our job is to make it better. And we're not. When I look at my daughters, and this is why I say my daughters are a big part of this, my oldest, Brenna, has a neurological condition she was diagnosed with at nine years old, right? She has a seizure disorder, she has OCD, and yes, I'm violating HIPAA all over the place here, right? But she went to Wolfson's Children's Hospital where she was treated, and thank God, and I mean that truly, thank God, she'll outgrow it by the time she's 16, not the OCD, but the seizure disorder, with no long-lasting effects, right? We're blessed. About two months after she went to Wolfson's, we were notified by Wolfson's that they were breached, and all of Brenna's data was stolen. They got her social, her date of birth, where she was born, her address, everything about her, everything they need to steal her identity. But don't worry about it, Wolfson's takes this very seriously, and they gave her a year of credit monitoring. Right? Now for people who don't know, at nine years old, you're not allowed to sign up for a year of credit monitoring. So Wolfson's paid for something nobody can use. And the problem here is this is not a year-long problem. Brenna's identity has been stolen. For the rest of her life, she may not have long-lasting effects from the seizure disorder, but she'll have long-lasting effects from the fact that Wolfson's didn't protect her data to the level they should have protected it to. And I believe very firmly that they didn't protect the data to the level they did because we failed. We, as an industry, failed. We are so busy building up our own egos. We're so busy being rock star ninja famous that we're not helping the people that need our help. We're supposed to be the superheroes. No capes. But we're supposed to be. And we're not. And if we wait for laws to come out and guidelines, who in the world's going to pick those, right? We got certifications doing it. How many people here are GX certified? Woohoo! So you signed the code of ethics, right? Did you read it? Nope, nobody does. <laughs> right? How many people here have a CISSP? Yeah. Do you want them picking our ethics? Do you want them? And nothing wrong with certification. I'm not sitting here telling you certification is evil. Right? I used to work for SANS. I have tons of GX certifications. I have the CISSP. Right? I'm not telling you that's wrong. I'm just saying, are there, is that where we want our guidelines built? Is that where we want our ethics to be determined? And I don't know about you, but my answer is no. While I have amazing respect for Alan Power, while I think Alan Power is an amazing man, I don't believe he is the only person who should be determining what our ethics are. And I know, I know, they have an ethics board and all that kind of stuff. I'm simplifying this significantly, right? But that's an option, right? We also have bug bounties. This is a great idea. Let's just open up our systems up and say to everybody, hey, hack me. Please tell me about it, though, right? Sadly, though, most of the bug bounty programs I see, they're finding low-hanging fruit, which, in my opinion, is a failure of a bug bounty program. If you still have low-hanging fruit, like cross-site scripting in a search button, search box, you shouldn't be opening up a bug bounty because you're not ready for it yet. That's like giving a four-year-old the keys to a Ferrari, right? You can't do it, but that's one thing. And then there's questions, right? How do you do it? How do you know you're doing it right? How do you know you've got the right people looking at your system? How do you know that threat that you always hear, right? Adobe did a bug bounty program and people bitched. They're just gonna give us a t-shirt, no money? I'll just sell what I find, right? That's what people said. Is that the route we wanna go? Again, I go back to, we're supposed to be fixing things. We're supposed to be the good in what we do. And I feel very firmly about that. I feel very strongly about this. I believe that this is the route to go. And this is not a popular one. You say licensing, and people are like, ah! I don't want a license. I don't want the government to determine whether I can be a hacker. Nobody determines whether you can be a hacker. It's a mindset. And I also want to point out that I didn't say government licensing. But I do believe that we, as an industry, need to start looking at something that says, I am able to do what I do. 
that I follow a certain standard, that I have a certain set of ethics, and that when I give you the results of what I give you, you can believe it was sufficient, that it met some standard, that I'm not some jackass who paid $1,600 for a Nessus license and called it a pen test, right? Do you know how many reports I see where all they did was take the logo off and put their logo on? I mean, hell. I was looking at a report just recently where the links went still out to the Tenable website for information about what the findings were. If you're not even smart enough to change the links, get the hell out. But licensing would fix that. But I will agree that I don't want the government to license us. I don't. I'm a big believer in small government. <laughs> and I'm not saying I'm a Republican. I'm just saying I believe in small government, right? And I think that the minute you say that the government's gonna license something, we have a problem. So what I think we need to do, and again, I wanna be very clear, I'm not that smart. I'm just some jackass who started a business, right? But if we started something up like the InfoSec Bar, right? Lawyers have it. Now, I wanna be very clear. The legal bar is a government entity. I don't want to model that part. But if we were to stand up and we said, hey, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to create a set of ethics. We're going to create a set of standards on how you test, how you do deliverables, and what a report should include, how you determine that something is high risk, how you determine something is medium risk, how you determine, right? If we set up that standard, we could then start working with it. And you're not required to do it. You're not required to be a bar member. Right? Many of the states in the United States allow you to practice law by calling yourself a lawyer. But if somebody wants to hire your service, you're able to say, I'm bar certified. Right? And we can hold you to a set of standards. We can hold you to when you screw up things, when you screw your customer, when you do things that violate our ethics, you lose that bar affiliation. And the reason I think that this will work is because of the movie industry. And no, it's not because I watch CSI Cyber. The movie industry was forced with the same idea. The movie industry started releasing movies, and people started complaining that the movies were obscene. And the government started talking about legislation. Their favorite thing, right? Next is taxation, but they would legislate. They'd pass laws to what the movies could have. Right? They would pass laws to determine if a movie was okay. And the movie industry said, whoa, 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 we got it, dude. And they created the rating system. Right? And they built a rating system and they started rating stuff. They self-inflicted a standard. And the government went, oh, cool, you got it. Awesome. Right? And then back in the 80s, I don't know how many people are old enough to remember the 80s, but I do, this horrifically horrible, disgusting, obscene movie came out, Gremlins. And um, <clears throat> people were like, ah, they blew up an alien in a microwave. Kids shouldn't see that. And people started talking about censorship. People started talking about legislation. Obviously, Hollywood has gotten too big for their britches, so we should legislate them. And Hollywood said, whoa, we got this one. And they changed the rating system to include PG-13, right? And a new rating came up. And the government looked at it and went, dude, you did it. Awesome, good, go on, have a nice day. And they solved the problem. And I'm not a doom and gloom guy, right? I'm not going to sit up here and say, the world is going to end. But I do believe very firmly that if we don't stand up as an industry and say, dude, we got it, and then actually get it, if we don't actually stand up and say, this is the standard we're going to follow, then that doom and gloom of the government passing laws, of the government saying security research is bad. And by the way, there is some security research that I think is valid, right? It would be like Germany. Distribution, and no, we didn't do Nazi comments now. Distribution of hacker tools was illegal, right? Now they change that. But if you were distributing hacker tools, it was against the law in Germany, right? Which I found funny because I couldn't give you a copy of Samurai WTF or Weaponized Flash or anything else like that, but I could give you a copy of Adobe Flash and Internet Explorer. <laughs> <coughs> but that's the route they went. In Italy, IP address. 
IP addresses are private information. Laws passed by governments about technology suck. They can't keep up, right? And that's why I say what we have to do is we have to stand up and do better, right? And I do think that it's something we have to do soon. I think it's something we have to do now. And I'm not the only person who can do it. Matter of fact, I'm not the person to do it. Because again, if we have one person stand up and say, I'll create the standard, it'll be based on that person's opinions. And what I think is okay isn't what Danny thinks is okay, isn't what Jason thinks is okay, right? And while the three of us may agree on most things, we don't agree on everything, right? And as an industry, what we do is so diverse, because we're not just talking pen testing here. Reverse engineering, forensics, incident response, security. We want to have something better than something like PCI, which is you must be this tall to ride the internet, right? We got to do better. That's what it boils down to. We got to do better. And I know it's a mushy, gushy thing, but if we don't do better, I'm scared to death for my children and my children's children. And that's why we got to fix it. Okay? So, got three minutes until I'm supposed to be off the stage. So, any questions? Yes, sir. We would definitely get badges, but we don't need stinking badges. <laughs> so, well, in that case, thank you very much, everybody. I'm honored that you sat here through an entire talk.